Welcome again. Right now we're on John chapter 21, verses 15 through to 25. Yeshua, Jesus, confronts Peter. Verse 15. So when they had eaten their breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Iona, Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know I have affection for you. I'm going to stop right there because you see Jesus is bringing back what they talked about just before his crucifixion. Peter's like, everybody else will forsake you. Everybody else will, 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 will leave you, but not me. You know, we all know the story. Peter ended up denying Jesus three times. So Peter said to him, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I have affection for you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I have affection for you. He said to him, tend my sheep. I just want to make it very clear that Jesus made a very clear distinction between feed my lambs and tend my sheep. Feed my lambs, meaning feed my little children. Feed those who are young in the Lord. Feed them. And then he said, tend my sheep, which means look after the elderly. Okay, the sheep are older than lambs. So Jesus here is saying to Peter, look, you know, look after my people. Feed my sheep and tend my lambs. Feed my little ones and look after my elderly ones. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you have affection for me? Peter was grieved because he asked him the third time, do you have affection for me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I have affection for you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. Verse 18, most certainly I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and walked where you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. Now he said this signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. When he had said this, he said to him, follow me. Now, Jesus wasn't very easy on Peter here. You know, you look at it right from the so-called last supper. Peter told the Lord, you know, if, if everybody else is unfaithful, I will still remain faithful to you. And, uh, you know, the Lord said, well, you will deny me, you know, and uh, and Peter did deny him three times. And here Jesus confronted him three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's like every time Jesus confronted him about whether or not Peter really loves him. It's almost like at that point in time, he was kind of reversing or atoning for the denial. You know, he denied Jesus three times. And then afterwards, Jesus confronted him three times about, about his love for him. It's like each time... Peter affirmed his love for Jesus, it's like he canceled out the denial that he did. And then at the end here, it's almost like Jesus' judgment upon Peter for his denial. It's almost like because of his denial, this is his judgment upon Peter. You will be crucified. Wow. Very, very powerful. Because that's what this is all about, right? When he said, you will stretch out your hands and you know, another person will dress you and they will take you where you don't want to go. It says here, that signifies by what kind of death that Peter died. And I've said this before several times as well. Is a lot of Christians, they believe that Peter was crucified as well and crucified upside down and so on and so forth. But a lot of these same Christians completely ignore or reject any extra biblical book that's not found in the New Testament. At the same time, Christian, do you know where that information comes from? Do you know where that comes from, that Peter was crucified upside down? It comes from the 
New Testament Apocrypha, by the way. And so I, what I'm trying to say is this. Let's not be hypocritical. Let's look at every document from this time in the same light. Let's not reject one document just because it's not found in, in the canon of your Bible. Okay. Verse 20, then Peter, turning around, saw a disciple following. This was the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who had also leaned on Jesus' breast at the supper and asked, Lord, who is going to betray you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I desire that he stay until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Now we know that John, the disciple that Jesus loved, was the only disciple. Isn't this amazing? The only disciple that was not killed for his faith. The only disciple that wasn't martyred. You know, a lot of us would want to be one of the disciples back in those days that, you know, you could walk with Jesus, you could talk with Jesus, you could have supper with Jesus, you could hear his voice in the flesh. But you know the price they paid? They paid a great price. All of them except for Jesus' favorite disciple. He's the only one that was blessed with a long life, although he was persecuted. But a long life without being cruelly put to death. So again here, verse 22, Jesus said to him, If I desire that he stay until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. This saying, therefore, went out among the brothers. Brothers here means brothers and sisters, it says, or siblings, that the disciple wouldn't die. Yet, Jesus didn't say to him that he wouldn't die. But if I desire that he stay until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies about these things and, and wrote these things. Wow, isn't this just awesome? We are reading the words from the disciple whom Jesus loved. We are actually reading the words of Jesus' favorite disciple. You can't get much closer to Jesus than this. Verse 24 again, this is the disciple who testifies about these things and wrote these things. We know that his witness is true. There are also many other things which Jesus did. Many other things here. Which if they would all be written, I suppose that even the world itself wouldn't have room for the books that would be written. Christian, you need to grasp the fact that there is a lot more to Jesus than what you read in the so-called canon of the New Testament. There's a lot more to Jesus than that. Okay? So you have to read it. You have to study it. It's very, very important you get educated. And may I, may I add, there are other books. You know, there is the Didache, the Gospel of Nicodemus, and so on and so forth. There are other books that are in our possession today that a lot of Christians just totally ignore because they're not in the Bible. Well, I'm telling you something. Peter, James, and John, and even Jesus didn't have the Bible, okay? Back in those days in the synagogue, every book was kept in a separate place in, on separate scrolls. They did not compile everything together and slap it between two covers and call it the Holy Bible. No, it was all kept separately. And you know what? It's a very good thing to have that. Jesus had no problem with that. Nowhere in history did Jesus ever say to anybody, okay, these books you're supposed to take, especially these particular books, slap them, put them all together in one book and call it the Holy Book, the, the Holy Bible. Nowhere did Jesus actually make that command. Nowhere, okay? Why? Because he wants each individual book to maintain its individuality. That's how it was back in those days. Each scroll was kept in a separate place. So when you walked over here, you saw the scroll of Isaiah. Remember in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus got handed the scroll of Isaiah? It doesn't say they handed him the Bible. They handed him the scroll of Isaiah. 
So when you walk over here and you see the scroll of Isaiah, you know, this is the scroll that Isaiah wrote. And this is the time frame that Isaiah wrote it in. This is the culture that Isaiah wrote it in. You know, oh, you walk over here. This is the book of Jeremiah. This is different than Isaiah. It's got a, it's a different tone, a different person, a different prophet, different word. Okay. Well, you walk over here. Here's the Torah of Moshe. Well, you walk over here and here is the Psalms. This was written by David, the king. And it's got a different level of authority. It's got a different air about it. It's got different circumstances that surround it, written in a different culture. So each book loses its individuality in the Bible. Now, am, am I against putting Bibles together? Well, the only thing the Bible has going for it is just convenience. You just put, put it all together in one book and, you know, and just put it in your pocket. You know, other than that, you lose the dynamics of the different scrolls of and the different books, the different authors. You lose the different, you lose the dynamics by putting it all in one book. You lose the diff, the hierarchy of scripture. You lose that. But you know, that's for another whole teaching. As you go, God bless you with great revelation. Show you great and mighty things. May you experience the blessing and the presence of the Lord. Blessings.